Hi, everyone. My name is Eugene Hernandez, and welcome to this conversation. Uh, I'm the Deputy Executive Director of Film at Lincoln Center and the Director of the New York Film Festival. And I just want to thank you all for joining us for this special conversation about another round, the Danish entry for Best International Film. It's a film that's directed by and co-written by our guest today, Thomas Vinterberg. And we're really thrilled to have uh, as our moderator for this conversation, uh, a dear friend of our organization, just as Thomas is, um, Mr. James Gray. Special thanks to our friends at Samuel Golden Films, the distributor of Another Round. And we'd also like to thank the folks at Synetic for making this conversation possible. Uh, and I also want to make sure to thank all of you who are listening in, either on our listening in on our podcast right now or watching this on our YouTube channel. We are looking forward to sharing lots of exciting films and programming with you in this year, 2021, including our Rendezvous with French Cinema series, which is happening uh, throughout the month of March in our virtual cinema. We hope you'll check out uh, all of our virtual programming until we can uh, be back in physical theaters, hopefully sometime later this year. Uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for uh, sharing uh, information and sharing content like this with your friends. So if you uh, enjoyed this conversation today, please feel free to share it with a friend, tell a friend. With that, I'm gonna get out of the way and look forward to listening and watching, just like you, this conversation with James Gray and Thomas Vinterberg. Guys, welcome very much. Uh, welcome and thank you very much for being with us today. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you. James, it's all yours. Well, I suppose I should introduce the director, right? Um, it's a very easy introduction. Uh, this Thomas Vinterberg is one of the great directors working in the world today, one of a handful. And uh, it's not often you can say that with sincerity, but he is and we have him. And so I think we should just get right to it and talk about uh, his, his latest work, which I think is pretty darn remarkable. Um, first of all, hello, I got to ask a very banal question, which is, uh, where are you? Are you uh, at home in Denmark? I mean, I have no idea where anybody is now. It's just Zooming and it's weird. Uh, well, first of all, Hi, James. Yes, Hello. I'm here in Copenhagen, and thanks for these uh, flattering words. I'm, I'm getting all embarrassed hearing this from you, and uh, who I respect uh, greatly. So um, thanks. Yes, I'm in Copenhagen. It's dark outside. I believe there's a full moon here, and uh, I'm ready to go. Yeah, it's a very strange moment. I wish we could do this in person, but alas, maybe, uh, maybe one of these months. Um, I'll I tell you a weird association that I had with your movie. When, it, when I finished it, I, I remember being up late one night and watching a Dick Cavett interview with George Harrison. And Dick Cavett was saying, uh, you know, why do you think all these musicians do all these drugs? And, you know, why, why is like Jimi Hendrix and Janis Joplin and Jim, why everyone's dying of drugs? And he looked at, at, at Dick Cavett like he was nuts. And he just said, because life is hard. <laughs> And right. I kept, I kept uh, thinking weirdly of that during your film, that this whole idea of being a little bit drunk, it's like the ultimate attempt at coping. And I, I wonder if you could speak to this idea, this, which I think is very powerful, about how the first, the, I, here's what I got from it, that the first notion was to kind of anesthetize you just a little from the, the smaller and greater injuries of life. And I wonder, is that, was that any part of the initial calculus for the thing? Definitely. I could, I could recognize myself in this theory that the film is introducing. That is that a real theory? I mean, it seems, it seems not like a real theory. It's not a real theory. It's, it's coming from a, a real scientist. Uh, but in the world of academics, uh, it wouldn't add up to real theory. <laughs> it's just something he said. And right. then we're, we're try, trying to make it a theory. Right. And I'm uh, trying to prove it. Um, uh, well, drinking comes from many places. One of the best alcoholics that I knew of, uh, my dear friend who wrote some of my early work, uh, the celebration and so forth. He said, it's a misunderstanding that you drink because you feel bad. He said, I drink when I'm excited. And 
and I just have to drink to maintain this feeling of this sensational feeling of being excited. Uh, so people drink for many reasons, I guess. But I think there's a tr sense of truth in, in Harrison Ford's words that problems disappear a little bit. Well, George, George Harrison, may I oh, say. George, oh, oh, Harrison a Ford. A, a, a beetle, a beetle, not an actor. Oh, Jesus, I thought it was Harrison. Wow. Well, it could have been Harrison. <laughs> it could have been. Um, problems disappear a little bit. And uh, self-censorship disappears a little bit. Right. And... Uh, what we're all trying to do when we're writing a script, I guess you know, you know all about that, and actors know about that, is the element of self for, self forgetting. Uh, I guess that's where you're happiest in life when you forget right. about yourself, or at least that's where your craft comes to the surface and you start to get inspired. Yeah, you know, it's uh, interesting because uh, when I was watching the film, I kept thinking. Uh, thank heavens none of these men is an angry drunk, you know, or so it seems like they're all they're all sort of amiably tipsy. You know, I, when I was uh, uh, in high school, I knew a guy who was just, you know, you put him put just a tiny bit of of wine in him and he was the darkest, angriest person ever. Like, you know, of course, the, 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 the real him, so to speak, came out. But these guys seem very amiable in a way and and have to confront some truths. But they don't become a darker version of themselves. They become more themselves in a way. Well, someone confronted me with, me with this, re having read the script, saying, Where, where's all the angry drunks? And I was like, I don't want to make movies about them. Right. These are not my heroes. These four yes. guys, however they may appear on screen, are my heroes. Yes. Uh, and, I, and I enjoy their company and they enjoy each other's company. Uh, so I did not want to uh, portray that. I, I simply left it out. Yeah. Uh, but we know, all know it exists, and uh, it would have been a different movie. Well, it's but it's, it's a great movie about that about yes. that side. Husbands from Casavetes is a fantastic of movie, of course, which which has a great deal of hostility and uh, what what in today's world would be considered malbehavior. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, uh, let, let me say, Thomas, uh, I did not miss it. Uh, this was not a criticism. I didn't miss it at all. And I, I, you're quite right. Husbands is very much more about that. And But one of the things that I was going to get at is because you're not talking about that, the film, uh, maybe I'm going to reveal something horrible about me. I found the film unbelievably funny for huge stretches. <laughs> like, And it's weird because we're so conditioned to be like, moralizing about alcohol you know like this kind of bullshit approach where like you shouldn't drink you know and then here it is it's not a cautionary tale really no it's supposed to be funny i'm glad you like you you laugh oh it is really funny man i mean and, huge uh, stretches. and of course it's supposed to show uh where alcohol can where alcohol can, alcohol can bring us in the uplifted funny excited life-affirming way as well as the right. dark side. But um, being moralistic was the first thing we promised ourselves not to do, uh, sure. to bias Lindholm and myself. We, we said, how can we do this as truthful as possible? To, to, to be honest with you, James, the, the beginning of this whole journey was to make solely a celebration of alcohol. We, we just looked at world history and saw all the great accomplishments, not the least from Brits, uh, having been done by people who are drunk. And we, we thought we had to celebrate that. But very quickly, a sense of an obligation and a moral responsibility came in, which I normally steer away from. But in this case, I felt uh, we, we have to look at the dark side of this as well. This is, this is, a, uh, this is something that kills people, destroys families. Uh, we got to look into it. And I found it fascinating that this same liquor can elevate situations and people and make great world leaders, make great decisions and yet still kill people. Yeah. Uh, so we, we said, we, we got to have to be in the middle. We got to make this a survey, an exploration and never be judgmental in any direction. Uh, and yeah, also well, make an ad advertisement for, for drinking. Yeah. Well, it's fantastic. Moment, but, but. So fantastic when, uh, 
you know, in his class, he basically points out that Hitler was the one who didn't have, you know, was the vegetarian, you know, teetotaler, like, <laughs> It, you you have to confront that you know he was the most morally debased person, and you know he wasn't he wasn't doing it. I mean, someone I, asked me. Someone asked me. So would he have won the world war if he had started the day with a schnapps? You know, but uh, uh, I don't think so. But but well, that's a whole other discussion. I, I do want to ask a sort of, if I may, a, a series of pedestrian questions, which um, unfortunately I was also curious about. I have to say, I don't think anyone gets more authenticity out of his actors than you. The film starts with all of the teenagers. It's interesting how the point of view shifts to Mads Mikkelsen pretty quickly, but you get away with it that it doesn't start on him. And wow. it, it, the, all that stuff seems have, has such very similitude, such authenticity. And I have to ask you just, I know it's boring, but as a director, I sat there wondering, how do you, is it, are you filming in, in, improvisation? Are you rehearsing it to the nth degree? I mean, it, it's not something that happens by accident. I, I kind of want to know the machinery of how you get at that authenticity, particularly with the teenagers at the opening. Okay, with the teenagers, uh, it's, that's a different ball game as with the actors. Yeah. The two very different things. With the teenagers, I actually find that interesting because there's been this experiment uh, at a bar where you offer uh, drinks to half of the crowd and the same drinks to the other half of the crowd, just in virgin version without alcohol. And then they, have, then they measure how drunk they feel. And it's exactly the same because they're in the same bar and it's the same music and everybody is, is, uh, is having a ball and believes that they're drink, drunk. And that was the case with these teenagers in the beginning. We, we, we gave them beer without alcohol. We told them it was without alcohol, but from running around and drinking this and listening to music and gearing themselves up, they got entirely crazy. And they just wanted to go out and they couldn't stop after shooting. And they went to town that night uh, and they were sober, entirely sober. I can promise you that. So it, it was an interesting thing about how this sense of a, a communal decision of letting go of control uh, can, can make people, can bring people to certain places, Tremendous. which raises another question, which is, can you get these to these levels of inspiration and artistry and uncontrollable behavior without alcohol. And my answer to, to that is, of course you can. In this case, they don't, they use the alcohol, but of course you have, you can get to these places. You, you and I are both writers and, and you know that you can get out there where you lose control and you're very inspired at late night with cognac, but you, you can also achieve it without. It, it's a, uh, it's a, it's a special, it's an interesting thing, but, but back to the actors and how they, and the authenticity, I, I guess in the beginning of this film, the rules are set very specifically. It's very clear for them what to do. So there's no confusion. They can forget about everything else than the game. And then they had this sense of communal euphoria. When it comes to the actors, you know as well as I do, it's longer. It's a longer stretch. I first you have to hire the best you can get. It's a bit. I guess it's a bit like being a chef. If you have, if you have good meat, you can make a good steak. But if you have, but you can also make a bad. But you can't make a good steak out of bad meat. Yeah, it's just it's just not possible. So, and these are the four biggest cannons we have in my country. Second thing is I write my scripts for them. I hire them before I start writing, basically. Uh, well, they, and means, they agree to do it? Well, Off a script, no script? When I was young and I did my first films, it was not a problem. And now they've gotten rich and famous and agents and shit. And it's a bit more complicated <laughs> because they want to read a script first. I understand, believe me. Uh, right. And, but I still, I'm still trying to get to this point every time I write a script, at least with some of the characters. Sometimes it doesn't work and then you have to write for 
uh, Al Pacino in The Godfather and imagine that. And then, and then you replace with some local Dane after, you know? <laughs> right, right, right. So but will, will, you, uh, will you improv with them, write down, you know, like a Cassavetti, you mentioned he husbands. I know that what he would do is he would get his troop together Uh, Gazzara and Falk and Jenna mm -hmm. and all those people. Mm -hmm. And then they would basically rehearse and improvise and he would type out what he thought were the best. I mean, I'm just trying to figure out how you work with those guys, because again, forgetting the teens for a second, unbelievable authenticity in that stuff. Right. And I'm of course very jealous about how you achieve that. So I, I guess I'm asking about the methodology with them once you've hired them. Well, my methodology changes f from actor to actor. I'm not religious about improv or not improv, uh, but uh, uh, I guess disappointingly little is improvised in this movie. Um, most of it is written. Why do you say disappointingly? Well, because <laughs> there's a lot of people who want me to be a uh, king, of, king of improv, but, I, but I'm not really. Uh, I write this and I write it for people I know, so it sounds improv. Right. But of course there is, there is, you know, there's exceptions, like when they go to find codfish in the harbor, it says they find, they try to fish in four stupid ways. And they're very, they're at this level, they're at 1.7 and then action. And, uh, and then they take it from there and we find some tools and that's improv. Right. But all the dialogues and stuff is, is written. But what I do, my, I guess my method is to, to work really hard prior to the shoot conversations rewrite more conversations uh debates rewrites again and then a rehearsal period which sometimes is fruitful sometimes is not but at least we've done it we're trying to map out this character we're saying where does this character come from what is he dreaming about for the future what what is he showing to the world and what is he hiding from the world uh Those how, four, how long is that period, Thomas? How long is your couple weeks? Two weeks. Uh -huh. Sometimes three. But those are the toughest weeks of the, sh of, of the whole production because there's, it's you and them. You don't have a crew. You don't have a plan. It's just, you know. Uh, and I'm trying to make as solid a foundation for them as possible so that when the camera flicks on, they can let go. They can fly. It's a bit like with a speech that you've rehearsed enough times to forget about the speech, so to speak. Right. And, uh, and I'm not talking about the specific scenes. Uh, I'm trying to rehearse the scenes before the scenes or after, so that like if there's a scene with someone popping the question, I would rehearse and improvise the scene where he's waiting in the lobby before he's doing it, or the scene right after when he's been rejected. Uh, so that the characters feel at home in what they're doing. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I remember, uh, I, I always try to do the same thing, Thomas, it's a, where you, you have the actor almost, it's, a, it's it, almost a, an essential where the actor has to read the scene before the one they have to play that morning, you know, to remember always where they're coming from and then where right. they're going to, you know, the context is everything. Right. Yeah, that's... Well, I, there's another word for what you're saying, and the word is craft. I mean, that is tremendous craft and uh, in a fantastic way. And I, I will tell you also, though, that the form that you're employing, which is, of course, all the handheld, it, it lends a very similitude. It's not because it's not bad handheld. It's not where you're doing it too much so that it's self-conscious. It feels very found. And mm -hmm. the fact that it feels improvisatory but is always controlled, that is a I must give you a huge, that is brilliant craft. I mean, that, there's no other way to put it. He, this cinematographer is a very smart guy, but he's first of all, very sensitive to what's happening in the scene. He doesn't have a thing that he wants to impose. He's there, he's open. Uh, we did have one strategy for this, which was to show the awkwardness and ugliness of being sober. <laughs> basically, uh, when they're sober. Like when you dance the first dance at a party and you knock your foreheads together, it's like, it's awkward. And the coffee machine starts boiling right as you're about to say your pickup line. And 
right? Uh, and then when they start drinking, things smoothen up and color appears. And, you know, that, that's sort of what we try to do. I, I just want to go back to, to the rehearsal period. I just want to, Please. for this movie, we had one week of serious rehearsals and another week of even more serious rehearsals, but which imply, in, included alcohol. Because I know they have to play drunk and they have to protect an emotional journey and they have to be funny and they have to be listening to each other. And, you know, th there was a lot of things I asked them to do. So I thought we got to nail this drunkenness. So I gave them alcohol and filmed it and we tried falling and we tried it, it doing it, um, it, you know, they tried to be, be teachers on certain levels of, of drunkenness. And we watched a lot of uh, Russian videos of people falling around. <laughs> and and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, Boris Yeltsin, you know, Boris Yeltsin is so legendary, you know. No, I got that. But of course, I got that. And I, I, I did want to bring that up. You know, of course, I had a list of these bullshit, pretentious questions. But uh, the, the one thing that is so perfectly rendered, because it is, you know, look, I, you probably don't know who this is, but there was this comedian in the 60s and 70s in America who used to go on all these like Dean Martin roasts. His name was Foster Brooks. And his one joke was playing drunk. And the way that he would do it is he would kind of be like, rah, 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 like this. <laughs> Your movie never makes a single mistake in rendering that kind of drunkenness. It never descends into like rah, 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 this kind of character. And that's very, it's brutally difficult to do. They're always inside the character. And I have to ask this, were they actually a little bit drunk during the shoot? No, no, I, di I didn't serve alcohol on, on the set because they, you know, they probably, they should be drunk in one scene and then they had to drive a car or be in front right. of children in the next scene. Right, of course. And, and also, James, um, there's this thing. I like to treat them as professionals. I've had, I've had fights with Lars von Trier about this. I find that when you put people through psychotherapy to make them cry in front of uh, the camera or you make them drunk or addicts to show that they're addicts. For me, that's an element of amateurism. And he got very angry when I said that, but, but I, but I, uh, I like that. I like to treat them as professionals because by not being private, I think they can make it even more personal to me more intimate. Does that make sense to you? Of course, it makes perfect sense. Because they don't have the private border or limit. And, and there's no element because it's a character and it's, it's a professional work and, and it's out here. And then, then you can really dig into the, where, where it hurts. Um, but, you know, so no, they didn't drink uh, on, on set. There's sort of something else. Uh, I hate this Zoom thing, you know, it's like a slight delay. So sorry about that. If I'm talking over you, I can't tell. But um, there, there's something else, though, beyond which I want to, I think is really important, even though I think the film is in, at huge stretches, absolutely hilarious. I found it also very, very sad um, for huge stretches because Mads Mikkelsen, without any, I mean, in the beginning of the movie is a, is a, shadow of his former self. He's a, a, a damaged, repressed kind of, um, it's a sadness that he can't really be his, have any of his sort of id come out at all. And that in a sense, the film becomes because of this sadness and this humor, ultimately I felt uh, became about love, about accepting the actual all of you, you know, the part mm -hmm. that's exposed and not the part that's exposed. So I don't I know if this that was... Analysis. That's a great, great way of seeing it, yeah. I mean, I don't know if this was part of the calculus, but it, it, it seems to me, you know, that it... I mean, I hate to use this word because I don't need it in art, but it is a very hopeful uh, presentation in some respects and that his dance at the end is an act of tremendous liberation. 
Right. I mean, I don't know if this is part of the calculus, but maybe you could speak oh, to oh, oh, yes, definitely. We, we wanted to show a character who has been caught up with life. And what does that mean? It means caught up with the element of repetitiousness, boredom, yeah. uh, lack of inspiration, yeah. lack, of, lack of risk, uh, yeah. confrontation with being old, confrontation with youth around him who are behaving like sharks, yeah. uh, a, a bit like actors who smell an insecure director, you know, <laughs> ready to kill. Uh, uh, they're, they're ready to fire him. He's, he's at his weakest point. Uh, and, and, he's, and he's being liberated from this, from, through this journey, not necessarily through alcohol, but through the, the love from his friend and through the element of risk, the element of exploration, the trying something, they're putting their life at stakes and uh, they're, they're getting somewhere with it. My wife, who I told you is, is more clever than I am. Um, she says that this movie is about the, uh, the uncontrollable. And I'm asking her, so what, what's the uncontrollable? What's that about? And she said, well, Thomas, uh, all the youngsters that I have at my church, uh, they, everything is measured. They have to appear on social media 40 times every day and they're being measured by their friends and graded. And they have to, at school, they're getting grades all the time. They have to map out their plans for the future. Uh, and every time I talk to a journalist, I know that he'll, he or she will know the number of clicks they'll get for how many people who read their article. Everything's measured. You and I, when we walk around with our iPhones, our steps are measured. Um, and I have friends who sit like this at night to, to get <laughs> <laughs> to a certain amount of steps. <laughs> now. <laughs> who do they think they're cheating? I mean, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty. So, so she says the world, the uncontrollable is what you cannot measure, like falling in love. You fall out of control and you meet something grand. You meet something that you could never have booked or prepared or ordered anywhere. Or being inspired, in which, which embeds the word spirit. Uh, and, you know, and I guess at the end of the day, this movie is a battle for that. It's trying to open up that little bit, that tiny corner we have for the uncontrollable and say, what happens if we let everyday life become a little less controlled? Uh, and Matt is being liberated by that. He, yeah. His main character is, is trapped from life and he's set free. And that's where he meets his catharsis at, at the end of the movie. That's sort of, that's what we were thinking. It's uh, beautiful. Right. It's beautiful. But, it, but there, there is obviously, there has to be some balance, right? Like you have to be open and you're right, everything's measured. But if you have no, you know, what's this, uh, just to get a little sententious, there's an old quote by Bertrand Russell. He said, a mind perpetually open is a mind perpetually vacant. So you, right. you, in some ways, it can't only be that, right? And his friend who's like peeing in the bed and like, by the way, that is an incredible performance moment uh, <laughs> when he's like in the corner and his one eye is open. Um, he's peeing on my wife, by the way, but, but I, only do, I only do that to her on screen. <laughs> no comment. But it's an incredible moment. But he has, at that moment, he has lost too much control. But like... I mean, basically, he's gone a little too far, hasn't he? I mean, he's literally oh, urinating totally. in the bed. He's not communicating with her at all. I mean, he's yeah. lost the plot a little. And then, of course, their friend dies. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming everybody here has seen the movie, thankfully. Uh, so I'm, I'm like ruining everything. No, no, no. Let's talk about everything. No, of course, we wanted to explore that as well. Now, right. we, before we talk about the journey of Max Mikkelsen or Martin, as he's called, uh, there's another journey in the movie, which is the guy who dies from this. Right. And and we, we, if we look at the world, it's, uh, this journey is all over the place. We know that. We all have friends or friends who have family members who lost their lives to alcohol. 
either they died or they have become become miserable. Uh, and uh, so there is this dangerous edge between living and dying connected to this liquor. Yeah. And I don't have the answers. Uh, that's why I show both. Right. I don't have the answer. I don't know how much people should drink or how people should live. I'm just having a look at this. I'm saying, so this guy's trapped. He's revealed. This guy has an okay life and he dies from it. And what are we going to do about it? And yeah. um, this openness I've insisted on because who am I to say of how course. people should live their lives? Of course. And maybe this openness is, is one of the reasons that, you know, in the Danish cinemas, we have 19 year olds with a bag of beer, having seen the film for the fourth time on their way out on a Friday night. And at the, at the same row, you have anonymous alcoholics who find that the film is about them. Because this guy is dying and Matt is obviously falling into the water at the end. And, and, and but for the boys, he's flying. You know, it's uh, it, um, right. Uh, this was not something we measured while writing it. We just didn't know how to conclude this. We couldn't find a conclusion. Yeah, but it's it's you're an artist. It's not your job to give answers. It's only right. your job to question. Um, I have to ask this of you since you just mentioned it, uh, and I I think I, I I did know it beforehand anyway, but. It's interesting, I found the film very secular in a way. Your wife, you said, is a priest. Are you yourself religious? Do you feel that the work is religious in some way? Uh, I'm not religious. I'm born and raised in a hippie commune by aggressive atheists, <laughs> uh, which I regret now. Uh, I Why, just do you regret? Why do you regret it? I... I I lost my daughter, a uh, 19 year old daughter. And uh, while making this movie actually, um, and which is a huge tragedy. And, but even before that, I was, I was finding the world that my wife is in as a priest, enormously rich. Uh, and I'm very, very curious about it. And uh, um so I'm, I'm open to religion, but I've, I've been raised with too many doubts and too much skepticism. So I'm, I'm somewhere, I'm somewhere caught in the middle of this. Uh, so, so I'm, you know, I'm investigating it. I, right. I'm curious about it, but I can't, I can't call myself religious yet. I have to say, I've too what many doubts. What does it mean for you to be religious then in such a context? What does that even mean, that word? Um, it means to have faith in what you're hoping for. Right. Which, is not, which, is, which cannot be proven. Right. Uh, and that's what they know a lot about. And in my situation, I'm obviously hoping to see my daughter again. Um, I, I lost her way too early in her life. So, so I find it, uh, you know, now more than ever, something that I'm drawn to and occupied with. Uh, but still, having lived 50 years full of skepticism is a difficult thing to change. <laughs> and no, probably quite healthy. Uh, f f faith and doubts come hand in hand, so maybe it's uh, it's an okay place to be. And when when, if you don't mind my asking, that's unspeakably tragic. When when did you lose her? How, were you shooting the movie? I mean, right. Uh, my daughter Ida was supposed to be in the movie. Uh, she it's at her school in her classroom amongst her friends. Uh, she two months prior to the shoot of this film. Uh, she sent me a letter from Africa, where she was at that time. Uh, having read the script, uh, she sent an unconditional love letter to me about the script. And I have to say that she was brutally honest with me. Uh, if I would wear a collared shirt, she would say panic age and, and leave the room. You know, she was, she was very confrontational with me. But this script um, caught her heart. 
uh, and then four days into the shoot, she was on her way back from Paris in the car to Copenhagen. And some, and she was standing in a queue because of a, some traffic jam. And some guy on a cell phone bashed into her car and killed her. Um, and I'm, I'm telling you this because of course it has to do with my movie. Uh, it's, and uh, it has to do with my entire life. But at that time, I didn't know how to continue life. Uh, and which is of course still hard. And um, uh, the only thing that made sense for me and Mats and Thomas Bolas and all my friends in this movie who knew her quite well or very well since she was born was to make this movie for her and make it to honor her memory. That was the only, that was the only thing I could get up, get up in the morning to do, to find just a path through this darkness. Uh, so if you feel the sense of uh, love on screen, it might have to do with the fact that this crew and these actors pulled out their hearts for me at this time. That's um, unbelievable. Uh, first of all, no wonder the film feels like it's about love. It is there in the film somehow. And it was always don't... supposed to be there, but uh, this situation left us, well, that, that was what she loved in the script. So it was there, but it left us all, and of course me primarily, unguarded and naked and without any sense of defense to the world. And in, that's the circumstance of, of shooting this movie. So when Mats was dancing at the end of this, this film, uh, not only for him, it was a beautiful catastrophe, you know, an ecstasy with someone who had died in the background. It was for all of us on set and for me uh, particularly. Um, so it, it was an extraordinary um, experience in, in, in all directions because there was so much love and so much brilliance in front of me. And yet still uh, there was uh, the greatest loss I, you can imagine. I mean, what'd you do? Just go right back to work? I mean, I, I, I don't understand. Uh, no, it was a couple of weeks as I recall it. I turned 50 the day after her funeral. It was all, it was all very uh, unreal. Uh, and my friend and co-writer Tobias Lindholm sure. took over the shoot for a period of time and they shot the funeral, which I, of course, I, I just couldn't do that. And they shot a couple of things and then I slowly melted in together with him and then I took over and took back the film. And, and that's how we did it. Uh, and I, to tell you the truth, shooting was really, really tough. But going to the bathroom or being sent home at night was worse. Because that's where life came back to me. I understand. Yeah. Wow. Well. Uh, well that is, that's unbelievable. And then when... I guess while you're doing the work, you can at least focus on that or lose yourself a little bit. I don't know. Can you, or is it like something that's, I guess it's. Well, you, you can for an hour or so, and then you have to go somewhere and cry and then come back. Uh, but it felt somehow meaningful to do this for her because there was so much her in it. And she yeah. loved it so much and she would have hated me, hated that if I stopped it. Uh, so now, you know, the praise that this movie is getting, uh, I just feel it's for her, which, which um, makes things make a little bit more sense than they did before. Right. Um, I mean, I guess I have to ask, like, through, through the, I mean, through the process then, I mean, where, where where are you now with it? I mean, you finished the film when? I don't know. With COVID, everything is completely <laughs> yeah. murky to me. 
did you finish it before this COVID period? I mean, when? Right. We, I finished the film before the COVID, which, I, which was very lucky. And actually uh, in Denmark, the cinemas kept open for quite a while. And so the film had a premiere and became a, a, a smash hit. I've never sold that many tickets uh, in my entire life. <laughs> People somehow wants to see something about drinking, uh, and uh, and it opened in France and had four days, which was it was number one in France, and but then they shut it down over there, and uh, you know, uh, so yeah, it, it came out, and I'm now writing my next thing and uh, spending time with my family and stuff. Yeah, well, it must be very surreal then to be have gone through this terrible trauma to expose yourself beautifully in the work and 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 then it's like a kind of house arrest for a year it's I mean, well, I we, need the, we need the house arrests i i'm thinking about all the people who lost family members or went bankrupt or suffer from claustrophobia but for us this protection is 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 good timing basically uh -huh. uh, we have, have you, you to, found it good you found it helpful to you oh yeah personally yes we went mm -hmm. to our country house and uh, and we're in it we're going through this process of 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 of, of sorrow so uh, we needed a calm and simple life basically mm. and and talking. those those kids the the high school kids that opened the film and are sprinkled throughout they were your daughter's friends then? Uh, not exactly those, no. Those were extras that we brought in from here and there. Right. Like, it was like there were some friends here and there, but some was casted from other schools. And, but it was pretty much her life, and it was her classroom and her school and her rituals. She's been on the lake road as well. It's all written from her life, basically. Oh, that, rit that ritual is a thing in Denmark, is it? Where they all puke like that and going you around the what? lake? One of the reasons I, 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 I decided to make this movie was for, because I had a visitor from America, a, a wonderful writer called Jane, um, super intelligent woman coming to Denmark. And she meets my older daughter who went to the same school and the same lake, lake runs. And she asks my daughter, uh, being an American, she asks, so Nana, what are you going to do today? And Nana said, um, oh, I'm going to run the lake run. And she said, oh, but what's that, Nana? And she said, oh, we have to run around this lake and empty a box of beer on time. And this woman is disturbed and looks at the dad. Like, when is he going to interfere? Uh, and the dad is Scandinavian and used to drunken kids in the street. So he's just giggling a little bit. That's me, of course. And, uh, and then she said, but Nana, aren't you going to get sick? And Nana says, oh, yes, but but if we vomit synchronized, time will be deducted. So that's okay. <laughs> and she's like freaking out and says, what about the police? And then Nana says, oh, but the teachers are there. And then uh, I suddenly realize there, there's something in this kingdom, which is very, very unique <laughs> in our alcohol culture and probably a little bit dangerous. I have to look into it. I have to look into this. Well, we're always reminded here in the United States uh, that Denmark is the happiest country on earth, according to practically all surveys. So maybe you guys are doing something right. Maybe, you know, they all, when they leave high school, they stop drinking and they become young adults. And, you know, uh, both my daughters were very successful at high school and my other daughter is becoming a doctor. And, you know, it's not like they're alcoholics, but they, they're just part of this uh, interesting ritualistic thing, which... Uh, Thomas, uh, can I ask you, uh, this maybe is a little bit too broad uh, a question, but so you'll forgive me, but when, when you're working, what I've noticed about your films is that they seem very personal but I never know, they seem not autobiographical, but they do seem personal, which is, it's a unique and interesting thing. And I, I wonder how you navigate that because like, you know, when I saw The Hunt, which I think is a fantastic movie, um, 
I get the sense both that nothing like that ever happened to you, and yet you're exposing part of yourself. Maybe it's your collaboration with Mads Mikkelsen. I can't really figure out how you do it. But what, um, what is the difference for you, I guess, between autobiographical and personal? Wow, it's a very fine line. There's nothing private or personal or, well, yes, personal, but autobiographical in any of these movies, you know. Uh, I guess when I write a character, and I think it must be the same for you, James, when, when writing a character, you invest a little bit of yourself in it. Um, in each one of the characters. This is the funny me. This is the tragic me. Right. This is the bragging me. Uh, this, this is the silly me, you know. Um, and then I dig really deep into these characters and they become lively somehow. And it, But you're right by saying it's personal, but not private. Um, also, getting an idea for a movie, I guess it's a bit like being in love. You... It's either, either you're interested or you're not interested as a writer or a director. Uh, you can meet a fancy, great idea, but it doesn't interest you. And then you can meet something which doesn't really have a beginning or a middle or an end or an, at, at least in that order or something. And it's very diffuse, but it, it keeps coming back to you. Yeah. Um, and those are the characters I work on. And I guess that's how it gets personal. I don't know. Now, is that, a, is that instinctual for you? Or do you think you have an, sort of, have you intellectualized the process where you say, I'm interested in subject X because of this, or is it just instinct? Uh, it's both. I think the work I do is a combination of structured work where I, you know, now we have to build a character. We need this, we need this, we need this. And then at some point it becomes unstructural and I completely let go, I just flow with it. Mm hmm uh, so it's a combination of things, and, and but a certain topics for films I don't have. No, right. I wish um, I had. Every time I have a conversation with an agent, you, you they ask, "What do you want to do, Tom?" And I don't know. And I guess it's the same for you, James. It's, uh, yeah, I, I have no clue ever. Um, I guess you uh, meet you this know, great producer who says, "Thomas, what should we do?" I'm like, "Something good," you know. It's uh, it's wide open. Yeah. Um, I I'm being told we have five minutes so I have to I have to end with this you have right now one of the great actor director collaborations I mean it's right up there with anybody else and uh, you know the, the the De Niro Scorsese collaboration the the you know I could go on and on but has your method if you have one if dare I use that word style evolved hugely with Mads Mikkelsen, or is it just basically like a, you have a common language, you don't have to talk much? I mean, I, I, I wish you could get into a little bit of that before we have to go. With, with Mads and me, we grew up in the same soil, having the same heroes, watching all the great films from Hollywood in the 70s, and I admire them. And uh, we know each other so well. He lives around the corner. We go to the same gym. There, our wives get, to, you know, we hang out. So I know him really well. And when you're in that sense of comfort, you can come really far and you can push it because he'll always have faith that I will catch him if he gets too far in some direction. Uh, and in that sense, I think we've developed, we didn't know each other when we started on doing uh, The Hunt. And we did, did that movie and a success is also good for collaboration, as you know. And then we flew around the world and celebrated that film and did interviews and got nominated and got to know each other really well. And now we, we know each other even better. So I guess there's a natural development be be between us. Yeah, his performance in The Hunt is incredible, but it's, it's, there's something here, he's so controlled and yet the emotionality is like ferocious. I mean, well, that is a, a, a very, very nuanced, uh, portrait and it's not like it's I, I I can't say better than the hunt it doesn't make any sense but it has uh, more flavors it certainly does yeah and it, it fe you what you feel is an evolving I guess what I'm trying to say is you feel an evolving artistic relationship going on there and that yeah. makes you guys a great duo 
Well, thank you so much. And I, I, I agree with that. And uh, I'll pass it on to Matt. He'll, he would love to hear this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's an incredible performance. It's almost like, it's weird too, because he's so magnetic. And somehow you buy him as a boring history teacher, but he was never my boring history teacher. He's too I'm trying, to, I'm trying everything I can to dress him down every time, but he just looks magnificent. And <laughs> he really does. Yeah. Well, there, there are we, I think this is about the, uh, uh, the end of this thing. And I, I yeah. hope that I've, I hope that I've, I've managed to do your film justice. It's a, uh, it's a magnificent work and you're one of the really great artists working today. And um, I just think I've been really honored to talk with you. So um, I wish you all the best. I'm Maybe a huge not. fan. And, and as I told you before, I watched, I've watched your movies over time and I watched Ad Astra yesterday and I, I've been flying all night. So uh, no, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a huge admirer. Thank you for this conversation. It was uh, wonderful. You, you, you're very welcome and you need not thank me at all. And I, I hope I see you in the flesh before this century is out. It's, uh, <laughs> it, and hang in there and, awesome. I, and all the great success with it because it's, it's gorgeous work. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you, Thomas. Thank you, James. Bye.